We're here at Grace Bible Church for our third Facebook Live message. Interesting, today is Palm Sunday, and uh, next week is Easter. So we're already into that time of year that is a great time of celebration for those who follow Jesus Christ, those who believe in Him. Before we get to our message, though, I want to share a few things, announcements, and some things that we're needing to go through this week here at Grace Bible Church. Again, I welcome each one of you that are being able to tune in this morning and watch. Here in Grace Bible Church Chapel, there is nobody seated. And uh, we know that you're at home and kind of having brunch with Pastor Jeff this morning here at Grace Bible Church. So hope you're in a comfortable place and we'll give you a message for about 30 minutes here. And hopefully it will be a blessing to your heart. My heart is sad this morning in the sense that um, we're not able to meet together. Uh, sad because of the things that people are going through today. Sad that people are falling into this crisis of the virus. Um, sad that people have lost their jobs or are laid off and they want to go back to work. It's uh, sad that we can't be together and fellowship one with another and, and shake one another's hands with social distancing and stay at home in order. It's just sad. I look forward to the day when we get back together and do those things that we're accustomed to. I'm thankful, though, that we can still fellowship live here on Facebook. It's a great platform that we can use and utilize and share with one another. Don't forget that, you know, each church relies upon the tithes and offerings of its members and regular attenders. I just want to remind our people at Grace Bible Church that we still take our morning offering, if you will, and that can be sent to Grace Bible Church, P.O. Box 18046. So don't forget to send those offerings in to Grace Bible Church, P.O. Box 18046, West Palm Beach, and that would be 33416. Also, each Wednesday morning, you're able to get on our emailing list and receive our Pray, Connect, Serve, and Give prayer list that we put together each week. Thank you, Kathy, so much for doing that for us. Uh, we're talking with our members during the week and our regular attenders with prayer needs and to able to keep that list going. So you get that in the email. Thank you for using that and praying for those that um, need your prayers. We appreciate that. Also, you get the devotion that I'm putting out. We're going through the book of Psalms right now, different Psalms that apply to the situation that we find ourselves in today. Again, Easter Sunday is next Sunday, April 12th, and I will be doing a sunrise meditation. It will be at 7 o'clock. And it'll be on our Grace Bible Church at Palm Springs Facebook page. It will be a live broadcast for about 12 minutes, a reflection upon the resurrection. Yearly, we normally do that over at the beach, but the beach is closed and we can't meet together. So I'm going to do that live next Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Also next Sunday at this point in this platform at 11 o'clock, we'll be here again, Lord willing, and we'll be doing communion together. So what a great time to celebrate communion on Easter Sunday morning, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'll let you know ahead of time that you'll need to have some juice and crackers in hand, and I'll have mine here, and we'll partake together and serve communion to you. Don't forget also that I have a Holy Week devotion for you. If you'd like that, you can email me or check with me somehow, and uh, we'll get that to you. But we sent that out to our GBC family yesterday. Starting today, it takes you through till next Sunday, a short devotion on each day of the Holy Week that we are starting in today, Palm Sunday. What a joyful time it is to be here celebrating Palm Sunday, the entry into Jerusalem for the Lord Jesus Christ. How he came in is, is of humble origin, of humble circumstance, on a colt, on a donkey. And he was the King of kings and Lord of lords coming into Jerusalem. He knew full well what was ahead of him. He knew full well what his week would be like. He knew he would go to the cross. He knew he would rise from the dead, but at the same time, he knew that there would be great suffering. So it's a celebration in one sense, but it's also a reflection upon what Jesus Christ did for each one of us. This is Palm Sunday, and we're grateful for this opportunity to serve you here today. This Palm Sunday as we celebrate. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of John chapter 9. John chapter 9 is where we find ourselves today, and Jesus has ended his discussion with the Pharisees in the temple. He's now is out now in the roads, the streets, the avenues, and he's meeting with the people. He's, he's practicing what he preaches, if you will. 
In way of introduction, I think of this story in John chapter 9. It's about a blind man who receives a sight. One of my favorite stories in the New Testament. I hope you're blessed by it today. But I think of what it would be like to be blind. Most of us, 95, 99% of us can't imagine what it would be like. But I do know one man who is blind, and he's one of the missionaries that we support here at Grace Bible Church. Dean Calder. He's a blind man who has a big vision. He started a mission called Crossway International back in 1997. And he's been active in Africa ever since and Nicaragua. In fact, if you'd like to see what his mission is about, you can go to YouTube. You can type in 2020 Crossway International Update. And you'll find what his mission is all about. You'll see a blind man serving the Lord with a great vision. Today's story takes place in John chapter 9, as I mentioned, of a blind man who was from birth blind, and now he, he sees Jesus. It's a story about people, so we can relate to this. That's what I like about Jesus. He, he relates to people all the time. This is a story about people. It's about Jesus. It's about a blind man. It's about his disciples. It's about the blind man's neighbors, the blind man's parents, and the Pharisees. All these people are connected in this one story about a blind man from birth who received his sight. It's a story about difficult challenges in life. The difficulties of living in this world today we can identify with. The prophet Isaiah talked about one who would come and restore the sight to the blind. If you'd like, hold your place here in John chapter 9. I'm going to look at Isaiah chapter 42. It's to the left in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 42. Before Jeremiah, it's after Psalm. Problems and Ecclesiastes. Then you get to Isaiah. Isaiah was written about 700 years before Christ came. And here's what we find in the book of Isaiah. Listen to this carefully because this is extraordinary. Here's what it says Isaiah 42, 1 through 10. If you have your Bible, if you're open to Isaiah 42, 1 through 10, follow along with me. If not, you can listen to the word of God here this morning. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Maybe you've heard this verse before, mentioned in the Gospels in Matthew. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretch them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on the earth. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes. That's what Jesus came to do. This is a prophecy from Isaiah 700 years before Christ came about what this this Holy One of God would do, this one sent from God, this servant, this elect. He would be a light to the Gentiles and he would open blind eyes. And we see that today fulfilled in John chapter 9. So back in John chapter 9, we begin our story this morning. Allow me to pray. Father, thank you so much. As we reflect upon this particular Sunday, Palm Sunday, we think of your entry into Jerusalem and why you went to Jerusalem. Thank you, Father, that Isaiah, 700 years before you even came, was speaking about how you would heal and open the eyes of the blind. And Lord, we see that realized today in this gospel account of John, chapter 9. Lord, give us grace this morning and wisdom as we understand and study your word. May it be a blessing to our hearts and comfort to our souls, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1, John chapter 9 says this in your Bibles. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. I love it when it says, now as Jesus passed by, he's out in the streets, as I mentioned before. He's out mingling with the people. He came to teach and heal. So as he passed by, he did those things. He was teaching and he was healing. Now as he passed by, remember a few Sundays ago when we were in John chapter 8, and there was a woman who was caught in adultery, and the Jewish law back then was very strict, and they were going to stone her. And Jesus was there, and he said, Let him that is without sin cast the first stone. And each one of them dropped the stones and walked away, and there was the woman with Jesus. And 
And he said, where are your accusers? Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Jesus gave her forgiveness. That's the type of person, the work that Jesus was all about. It was about restoration of our human soul. And then he said after that, after he, he forgave that woman and gave her guidance, he connected with her and, and, and provided for her restoration of her soul. He said this, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus saw a blind man from birth, and you know there was a sense of hopelessness there in his life. No doubt about it. A hopelessness that we can't identify with in this particular case in human life. Here we find in verse number 2 it says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Teacher, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? They were puzzled by this. So as the disciples now enter the picture, they ask him this question, Who sinned? My question for us today is this. Does sin directly cause all suffering? Let me repeat that. Does sin directly cause all human suffering? You know, sin is in every heart. Sin bursts forth in every aspect of life. It's present. Sin separates us from God. The Bible clearly tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the question I have for you is, is, why is there suffering and evil in the world? Why is there this, this virus that we're having to deal with today? And all through the course of history, we've seen suffering and evil present. You know, I respect, uh, and I have a friend, his name is Mike, Pastor Mike, of the Dresden Bible Church. And I listened to one of his messages that he gave last Sunday on this particular matter. And uh, tremendous. He was talking about divine revelation, that we do have that present in our midst divine revelation, the Word of God. And God does reveal to us many things about life, about ourselves, about Him. But you know, some things are, are silent in His divine revelation. And one of those areas of silence that we see is, why is there suffering? Why do things happen the way they do? Sometimes we get a glimpse of understanding it, but there's a lot of questions unanswered. And that's okay with me, because God has chosen to show us what He wants us to know. And some things are left with him only, and secrets of God that one day he may or may not reveal to us. But God is God. He's the creator of heaven and earth, just as you saw in Isaiah chapter 42. So we can understand some of the reasons why there's sin, and the disciples are trying to understand that. Did this man sin? Who, who sinned? Was it him, or, or was it his parents? How could he sin in the, in the womb? So there's a question here, trying to understand exactly what was going on. Verse 3 says this in the Gospel of John chapter 9. Jesus answered this question saying this, Neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. What, a, what, what an interesting perspective that Jesus is now giving. Who sinned? He said, this man, his parents didn't sin, but it was caused so that God could be glorified. You know, sometimes things happen to us for a reason. Sometimes difficulties happen to us because of something we may or may not have done. Maybe um, physically speaking. You know my grandmother who almost lived to be 100. She lived to be 99 and a half. Grandma Berman. And I asked her, what's your secret to long life, Grandma? And she said, living in moderation. That our human nature is not to live within means and with, within parameters, within moderation. And because of that, things happen. There, is, there does exist in the lives of God's people chastening at times as God deems fit. Just as we as parents, we, we train and nurture our kids as they're growing up. God trains and nurtures us as we go along in our lives as his children. Do you know who the children of God are? It's those who have come to Jesus Christ by faith. For we are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the scriptures, that's what the Bible teaches. So if you put your faith in Christ Jesus as your Savior, you're a child of God. It's different from being a created being of God. A child of God is being born again. Hebrews 13 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11 talk of the chastening that comes in believers' lives, which God seems as He seems fit to give. And it's for our own good. It's to bring us more into a likeness of Him, how to live our lives in a, in a way that glorifies and honors Him. But He said in verse 4 and 5 this thought, He says, I must work the works of Him who sent me. This is Jesus speaking. While it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And that's 
be so full of the woman who was about to be stoned. And that's what the prophet talked about. The light of the world would come. I must work the works of him who sent me. That's what Jesus just said. What are the works of Jesus Christ? Because it's very important that we understand this. Because it has to do with salvation. What are the works of Jesus Christ? Well, we have a, a, an answer to that in John chapter 6, verse 29. John 6, 29 says this. Because Jesus is mentioning here, I must work the works of him who sent me. So what are the works of God? It has to do with this week of passion. Here's what he said. John chapter 6, verse 29. This is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. The day is now, the night is coming. What that means is when it's daytime, we have time to do the work, but at nighttime, the work will cease. Jesus' time was, was going to be short-lived, and that brings us to Easter week. He knew what was coming. He was still living in the day, but the night would come. The work of God is that you believe in Jesus Christ, the one who God the Father sent. And this man is listening to this, the blind man, and here's what happened in verse 6. Jesus looked at him, and the blind man couldn't see him, he could only hear his voice. Jesus did something that irritated the legalistic Pharisees. But here's what happened in verse 6. When he had said these things, he spit on the ground and made clay with his saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Very humbling, very humiliating in one sense. Spit on the ground, made this, this, this clay out of his spit, and, he, and he, he, he massaged it, he kneaded it as you would bread, and he, then he put it on the man's eyes. So Jesus was doing work that was prohibited by the Sabbath day. The Jews knew that, and they're very irritated by it. Let me tell you something about the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was created for man. Man wasn't created for the Sabbath. In other words, we're not to be legalistically, legalistically bound to the laws of the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was given to give us something in life that would benefit us. It's not benefiting the people here because they're judgmental and they're legalistic about it. The Sabbath is designed for rest, for comfort, for our own, for our own bodies. It's good for us to have a day of rest. It, it's, it's for our good. But we're not bound to it legalistically. It, it has nothing to do with our salvation. For the Jews, they believed it had something to do with their salvation, how well they kept the law. If they could keep the law good enough, God would be happy with them, and they felt self-righteous by doing these things and accusing other people of not doing them. But we see humble faith here on the, on the part of the blind man. Go wash yourself in Siloam. I love that, that, that title, Siloam, or Siloam. You know, there's a town in Arkansas where our, two of our kids live with their families and our grandkids, Siloam Springs, Arkansas. So it's a wonderful, quaint little town. Uh, we love going there because our kids and our grandkids live there, but it's also a very pleasant place to be. The word Siloam here means sent. Jesus was the Siloam. For us, for this man who was born blind, Jesus is the Siloam. He's the one sent. He's the one sent from the God, God above, the heaven, the, the, the Father of heaven and earth, the, the creator of heaven and earth. He was the sent one from God the Father to give life. And now the blind man was sent to receive sight. He so desperately wanted and he so desperately needed. Now we come to another group of people, the neighbors, verses 8 through 12. Look at this. Very interesting. Verse 8 says, Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? They were puzzled by this as well. This is he, the other said. And he said, the blind man, I am the one. This, this is me. Therefore, verse 10, they said to him, How are your eyes open then? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I see now. I received my sight by just doing that. Then they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I have no idea where he is. That was the conversation with the neighbors. So the neighbors were there, gave testimony of what happened. How are your eyes open? He said, a man called Jesus did it. Where is he? he said, I don't know. Do you? Do you know where Jesus is today? Because he holds the answers to life's many questions. You want answers to life? You better find out where Jesus is. 
Where is he today? Well, we kind of find the Pharisees now in verse 13. It's interesting because they come into the picture and they're not happy with this at all. Verse 13, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees and it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and, and, and opened his eyes. The Pharisees also asked him and asked him, how did you receive his sight? He said, he put clay on my eyes and washed and now I see. And what is his answer? They wanted something a little more detailed. There were some of the Pharisees who said, this, is, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Imagine that. So judgmental because of your legalism that you can't even see the light of life. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Then some others were kind of thinking logically, well, how can a man who was a sinner do such thing? You see, that's a good question. Because a man who could heal like this had to be from God. And there was a division among them. And so they're talking about this. In verse 17, they said to the blind man, Why, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes? He said he's a prophet. Look at this. Very interesting. This man is not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. Here's what legalism does. It, it, it produces judgment. They asked the man who was born blind and now he sees, what do you think about this man? Who, who do you say that he is? The prophet. So now the parents come into the scene. So there's groups of people here, and we see the parents, verse 18. They ask, Is this your son? Verses 18 through 23. How is it possible that he see? So they're asking the parents this. Is this your son? And if so, how is it possible that he can see? Because he said he was born blind, and the neighbors have given testimony to that. What do you say? The parents were careful on what they how they answered the Jewish religious leaders at this time. They were fearful of the Jewish leaders, and they didn't want to answer him in a way that would cause them to put them out of the synagogue. That would be a cultural disaster for them. It would be shame on their family. You see, legalism does so much damage to people's hearts. God is not legalistic. Christ doesn't say that we have to keep a list of rules and regulations to have eternal life. It, it, it's by grace we're saved through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and if not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Pharisees failed to see that. They failed to see what Isaiah 42 said about the servant, the Holy One who would come and be a light to the world who would open the eyes of the blind. If they would only open their eyes, they would see that this was the Messiah. So that's the discussion with the parents. And then the parents finally said in verse 23, after they're asking him, how did this happen? And they said, hey, he's a grown man. Ask him. Just go ask him. See what he has to say. So the man comes before the Pharisees, and this is the most interesting discussion that he has with them. Look at verse 24. So they called again the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Jesus, he couldn't have done that. He's a sinner, so give God the glory. Admit it. He's nothing except God did this. Verse 25 says, Whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he said, I already told you. I like that. Aren't you listening? How many times do we have to be told something over and over again until we finally listen and hear what's being said? And the blind man's being much wiser than the Pharisees here. He says, I already told you what happened. He spit on the ground and made clay and put it on my eyes. I washed in this pool silo and I was blind and now I see. What more do you want to know? Are you listening to me? So there's a bit of sarcasm here that comes out in the voice of the, the blind man, the formerly blind man. He says this, do you also, because you're asking me all these questions again, do you want to become his disciples as well? And they said, listen, you don't know what you're talking about. That's that's really what they're implying here. He says, we're disciples of Moses. Look at that. Verse 28, they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. Verse 29, we know that God spoke to Moses. As to this fellow, we do not know where he is from. They should have known because Moses spoke of Jesus Christ. In Deuteronomy, in the Torah, the Messiah, the one who would be sent as God's servant, is mentioned. 
Had they looked at the scriptures carefully, they would have understood that this, who this was they were seeing today is that person that Moses spoke of. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet. And that's the blind man said, he's a prophet? Like me from your midst, him shall you hear. One day Israel will hear from Jesus Christ. He's coming again. The second coming is without doubt. The man teaches the Pharisees, and the Pharisees respond by verse 34. They threw him out. They've had enough with him. We see how the unlearned and foolish, the formal blind man here, if I could classify him as that, because that's how they saw him, an unlearned and foolish person, how he has now confounded the educated and the wise. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, you should take a chance to read that because I'm almost out of time here. And I want you to see that. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25 talks about that very fact. The message of the cross for some is foolishness, but for others it's the power of God. Palm Sunday to Easter, we reflect upon what he did for us on the cross and how he rose again. The message of the cross is for some, it's foolishness. And for these Pharisees, these legalistic, blind Pharisees of the day, this religious leader of the day, these religious leaders, they were being foolish. They were educated and, quote, wise, but not according to God. The message of the cross, the message of the Savior, the, the message of the light of the world was foolishness to them. You know that those who believe it's the power of God, and you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You that have, you of those of you that have accepted Christ as your Savior, you understand that because of what He did and where He is today in heaven, that's the power of God in your life. Give thanks for that. What is it to you? Foolishness or the power of God? Finally, we come to this last portion of Scripture: Jesus with the man. A very tender moment that Jesus speaks to this man. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when they had found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of God? And today, today's title of blind faith, we see now how the blind now is where his faith is. Do you believe in the Son of God? And he said in verse 36, I want to. Oh, do I want to? Yes, I want to believe in the Son of God, but who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? That was his question. A formerly blind, now we see him. He's had all these discussions with people. Jesus asks him, do you believe in the Son of God? Do you believe in God, the one who was coming to be the light of the world, the one who would forgive sin? Do you believe in the Son of God? It speaks to the, the deity of Jesus Christ is what's happening here. And that's what the book of John is all about. Every Sunday I say that if you go through this gospel. John is here to declare to the world that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is asking the former blind man, do you believe in the Son of God? I want to, Lord. I want to. I want to ask you a question. Wherever you might be, do you believe in the Son of God? Do you believe that He died on the cross for your sins and rose again? And if you say, I want to, then you can. By going to Him and saying, Lord, I believe. I believe that you died for me. Remember John 3 16? God's promise? For God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son. That whoever believes in him, you will not perish, but have eternal life. So, do you believe? If you want to, then you can. And you can be given eternal life. You become his child by faith. And here's the title of the today's sermon, verse 38. Look at that in your Bible. And he said, Lord, I believe. He now has true faith. Yes, he could see physically, but now he sees spiritually. His spiritual sight has been restored to him. Lord, I believe. What happened next? Faith produced worship. Isn't that wonderful? God receives our worship because of our faith in him. Faith can produce worship. Give God the glory this morning. Worship him. Give him thanks. You know, when we have a thankful heart, we're worshiping him. No matter what the circumstances, no matter how difficult things may seem today, we know where he is. He's in heaven. The Holy Spirit is within us. He's here today with us. Worship him. Give him thanks. Learn to trust him. In concluding, 
Verse 39 through 41, we see this. The judgment I have come into this world, but those who do not see me may see me. That's why he came to the cross. So that those who do not see would receive spiritual sight. Three questions. Closing here this morning. How is your faith? Or I should say, how is your spiritual eyesight? This morning, how is your spiritual eyesight? Number two. Do you want to see more of him? Well, I sure do every day of my life. I've been on this journey for 50 years studying the Word of God. I continue to want to see more of who he is. By, by going to things like this where you can study the Word of God and hear the Word of God, listen to what he has to say, learn, how, learn, learn to talk with him, begin talking with him, be with people who believe in the Word of God so he can be encouraged. And then finally, by faith, you can begin to worship and praise him. I hope this morning that this has restored some of the hope that you've already had in Christ Jesus, the risen Savior. As he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he did that with purpose. He knew what he was doing. He went to the cross because he loves you and he loves me. That's closing for him. Father in heaven, thank you for this morning together, a message from the Gospel of John. Lord, continue to encourage us this day. Thank you for the hope that we find in Christ Jesus. Lord, as we reflect upon Palm Sunday and this week, the Passion Week, all the way to the cross, and then the resurrection next Sunday, just be alive in the hearts of your people throughout the world. Thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate this morning who you are and what you've done for each one of us. Thank you for your protection over each one of us and our families. We pray your blessing upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you next Sunday morning, if you like, at 7 a.m. for a sunrise service, and then we'll be here back at 11 o'clock next Sunday, Lord willing, for a communion celebration. God bless each one of you.